This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Now, yesterday you heard a detailed introduction about her background and all the awards she's won, so there's no reason for me to reiterate how she just won the $100,000 Gardner Award, or the Selman Waxman Award from the National Academy of Science, or, or that she's been the first uh, uh, female director of uh, the Beckman Center, and, uh, and she's done all these amazing things. So the first thing that came to mind is why me? Uh, why do I get to introduce Lucy Shapiro? So I thought about it and I thought, well, we both went to Brooklyn College, we both escaped from New York, and we wor both work on developmental bacteria that don't cause any disease and uh, most people haven't heard of until recently. So uh, why Colobacter? Well, Colobacter has an interesting history. It really came into prominence when Roger Stanier and Gene Poindexter isolated, they were looking for organisms that would grow in the distilled water of the Life Science Building. And sure enough, they isolated Colobacter crescentis because it grows in very dilute environments. Of course, uh, a, a little bit while later, uh, Mike Dudorf told me, uh, they found a dead rat in it still. So uh, possibly there was some organic material there as well. Anyway, um, uh, after Stanier uh, uh, and, and Gene Poindexter uh, worked out the life cycle of this uh, very interesting organism and realized that uh, it has two forms. It forms uh, a, a stem cell like uh, a stalked cell that uh, puts out swarmer cells. And, and this was a very interesting model for studying uh, cell differentiation. And so uh, uh, Dr. Shapiro realized the tremendous power of this system and she almost single-handedly developed this field from just a kind of a gee whiz type phenomenon, phenomenology of, of bacteriology into a, a detailed model system for studying the cell cycle. So she's uh, accomplished quite a bit. She has over 250 papers. She's mentored over 31 PhD students, 50 postdocs, and her recent graduates have established themselves in major universities in actually throughout the world. So it's really a credit to her that she's accomplished all this. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Lucy Shapiro uh, to give our lecture on Colbeck. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, I might add to the introduction that David Zussman gave you about where Colobacter grows. Uh, when, I was Albert I when I was at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, we isolated one of the first bacteriophages that affect infects Colobacter in the Bronx tap water. Uh, and it's the largest phage ever isolated. So whether there are dead rats in the drinking water in the Bronx or not, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, Colobacter can be found everywhere. And it is probably one of the most ubiquitous bugs on Earth. Uh, we have used this bug uh, as a way of carrying out, in essence, systems engineering on a living entity. Uh, what I show here is the cell cycle of Colobacter and why we're interested in it. Uh, as you can see, every division is asymmetric. Uh, you start off with a cell that can swim. It's called a swarmer cell. It has a flagellum at one pole, and there are pili at this pole as well. This is the chromosome. Uh, this cell is not able to initiate DNA replication, and it's present and swims around for about a third of the cell cycle, independent of the generation time 
and independent of the nutrients. Uh, once this swarmer cell differentiates into a stalk cell by ejecting the flagellum and building a stalk in this place, and as Jeff Skirka showed, sucking these pili back in, then you can initiate DNA replication shown by this theta structure. Uh, replication is, uh, goes on during this S phase. Uh, cell division happens here, but you start making the components of the cell division machine quite early. Uh, flagella biogenesis occurs in a hierarchy of about 42 genes and then is assembled at one side of the cell and nowhere else. Once the chromosome has completed its replication, then an enzyme that methylates the DNA gets turned on. And this is important because I'm going to come back to this. So when the cell divides, you have two fully methylated chromosomes. And as you, when you initiate replication, and the replication fork travels around the chromosome, you get two copies that are hemimethylated. And then you don't, that would be here, this is a fully methylated, you initiate replication, and you get two copies that are hemimethylated. The reason why it happens just here is that the cell, as I'll show you at the end of this talk, uses the methylation state of the chromosome to integrate multiple regulatory events. Now, all, and pili biogenesis, of course, happens between here and here in the cell cycle. Each one of these boxes represents what I call a functional module. In other words, there are multiple genes within each one of these boxes that have to carry out their function. Each module gets turned on at a specific time in the cell cycle. And there are four master regulators that control 200 cell cycle regulated genes each group within this 200 sits in one of these boxes. So now turning to understand how this might be, not how you might get regulators to turn these various things on, and how many levels of control allow you to do this, and most importantly, how are these regulatory events coordinated? So uh, back in the year 2000, a then graduate student in the lab, Mike Laub, uh, did the first cell cycle microarray of a bacterial cell. We had just gotten the sequence from Tiger. And what he did was synchronize the cell cycle, which is probably one of the best things about Colobacter. You can actually synchronize these cells. And starting with a swarmer cell every 15 minutes, he took a sample, got the RNA, and then did microarrays. And in yellow, it shows genes that are turned on, blue genes that are turned off. And there is a hardwired pattern during the cell cycle of a consistent set of genes that are turned on and off as you move through the cell cycle. An example is for the DNA A gene, which is required for the initiation of DNA replication. And that's turned on in preparation for turning on the replication of the chromosome. Another example is the hierarchy of flagellar genes that are turned on just when needed to build the flagellum at this pole. And here is that DNA methyltransferase that's turned on at the end of the cell cycle to remethylate the chromosome. And I could fill this in with many, many, many genes. We know almost all of them at this point. And so this is turning on a gene not in response to glucose or not in response to lactose, but rather a hardwired pattern of gene expression as you move through the cell cycle. So what could be involved in this? Uh, well, bacteria, and colobacter as well, generally use the two-component signal transduction paradigm. Uh, most of the uh, initial work revealing how these things have been done was done by Sidney Kustu here at, at Berkeley. And the paradigm is that there is a histidine kinase, uh, which can have a part of its uh, protein sticking out into the uh, to the periplasmic space, or it can be inside, generally a dimer, uh, and some signal, either inside or outside, causes autophosphorylation of the histidine, uh, and then CTRA is phosphorylated on an aspartate. In this case, this is the global regulator in Colobacter, and here we have a response regulator attached to a DNA binding domain, which does not have to be the case. In this case, it is true, and it acts as a transcriptional regulator. Uh, the uh, 
Kim Kwan, a graduate student in the lab, identified CTRA, and then Christine Jacobs, when she was a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, identified the kinase that's involved in this phosphorylation reaction. There has since been shown to be another protein in between, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, this CTRA protein was very surprising. It was found initially because it controlled flagella biogenesis, but it was very perplexing because it was also an essential gene, and the flagellum is not essential for viability. And then it turned out I had different people in the lab working on different functional modules, and to our astonishment, we found that this one regulatory protein controlled the onset of flagella biogenesis, pili biogenesis, turned on the, the DNA methyltransferase gene, uh, turned on the genes for the chemotaxis machinery, as well as cell division genes. One curious thing about this response regulator is it's not only a transcription factor, but when it's present in the cell, it sits on the origin of replication and silences it. So there is a protein that both is a transcription factor and a silencer of the initiation of DNA replication. This protein does not control stalk biogenesis, DNA replication, or chromosome segregation. But as you can see here where I've colored in where CTRA is, CTRA is in the swarmer cell where it's sitting on the origin of replication and silencing it. Then in order to turn on DNA replication, this thing has to be cleared out of the cell. Then you stop the proteolysis of CTRA. It again now accumulates, turns on functional things, and then there is uh, a closure of the inner membrane of this pre-divisional cell, creating two compartments. This compartment has the CTRA in it, and you're silencing the origin. This compartment again clears CTRA out of the cell by proteolysis, so you can initiate uh, DNA replication, therefore each progeny of a division is asymmetric. You get two different cells. Not only do they look different, because this guy can swim away and this guy's got a stalk, but this one, cannot, this one cannot initiate DNA replication, and this one always does. Clearly, that's this one. So now I showed that CTRA is present, gets cleared away, it comes back, gets cleared away here asymmetrically. What about this kinase? Here's the intermediary protein. What about this kinase? And this was an experiment that Christine did. Uh, she first showed that this kinase was present throughout the cell cycle by Western blots. But it seemed to be only functioning sometimes. So what she did was label it with a GFP derivative and made the surprising observation that this protein is localized to the pole of the cell and uh, Antonio Iniester and Nathan Hilson have re recently shown that if this thing isn't localized to the pole of the cell, it can't function. And it is at these times in the cell cycle that it is involved in phosphotransfer to the CTRA protein and activating it. So again, by the time Christine showed this, Janine Maddock in the uh, lab had already shown that the chemoreceptors are localized at the cell pole. So we knew that polar localization of proteins, in fact, happened. So now we were faced with the question, how do you go about using the three-dimensional organization of the cell as a regulatory phenomenon? How do you incorporate that into transcriptional circuitry, into proteolysis, into the multiple layers of control? One of the critical events which I'm sure you realize at this point, is getting rid of CTRA here. And it has to be absolutely specific, and we ha it has to be controlled. So this is now another surprising observation. The CLIP-XP protease, which has six subunits of the chaperone CLIP-X and 14 subunits of the protease CLIP-P, it's like a little wearing blender. Uh, CTRA binds to a factor, RCDA, uh, which then brings it into the wearing blender and chews it up. But the surprise was that this protease complex localizes to the pole of the cell. And then the CTRA and RCDA, in other words, the substrate comes down to the protease, CTRA is chewed up, and then surprisingly, 
It goes away from this pole, but then assembles at the cell division plane, goes away from that, and then reassembles only at this pole so that you choose CTRA up here, but not here. So this is just uh, an example, a cute little uh, uh, movie that was made by Antonio Iniesta. And this work is really a summary of the work of Antonio Iniesta, Patrick McGrath, and Kathleen Ryan. And as you can see, it goes to the pole. And it, the substrate comes in and is chewed up. This clip XP protein is a single domain response regulator that, in fact, is required to local, excuse me, the CPDR, single domain response regulator, is the factor that is required to bring CLIP XP to the cell pole. So now, the critical question is how is this integrated with the uh, passage through the cell cycle and the role of the two component signal transduction proteins? So this CPDR protein, which I introduced to you once before as a single domain response regulator, can exist in the phosphorylated state or the unphosphorylated state. When it's in the unphosphorylated state, we call it active because it's in the unphosphorylated state that it allows the, uh, the uh, protease complex to go to the cell pole. What's amazing is that this kinase that I showed you a moment ago as the kinase that activates CTRA is the same kinase that keeps this CPDR protein in the phosphorylated state. So in a very robust way, the same kinase that activates CTRA prevents its degradation by keeping this thing in the phosphorylated state. Now, when, this, when uh, we have CPDR in the unphosphorylated state, it localizes the protease. CTRA and RCDA then go to the protease and get degraded. Now let's put it together with the localization of this, of this kinase. So here we are in the swarmer cell. And in the swarmer cell, CPDR exists in the phosphorylated state. Therefore, the uh, protease is not localized. Then you have the localization of the protease and its substrates here. It's degraded. And then you get the localization of this kinase to this pole, and it's now active. So what happens when this kinase is active? CPDR accumulates in the phosphorylated state. Those are all the yellow dots. Uh, then this begins to form uh, two uh, compartments with the kinase trapped up here. And because of that, triggered by, by uh, cytoplasmic compartmentalization, you then degrade CTRA because the protease via CPDR is localized to that cell pole. So in fact, there is a correlation between multiple three-dimensional uh, observations. Number one, you have to localize the protease itself to a specific place. Number two, when you form two, component, two compartments, you trap the protease in one compartment and not the other. And, uh, and you, you're trapping the kinase that makes sure that this guy is not able to localize the protease, but this one is. So there is now a connection between localized proteolysis and the phosphosignaling cascade. This thing then chews up CTRA, and it can initiate DNA replication. So what I've shown you is that CTRA is cycling through the cell cycle. But we predict that there has to be at least another regulator that happens when CTRA isn't around, because we know that multiple proteins are made at all these different times in the cell cycle. So the second uh, uh, regulatory protein, uh, GCRA, shown here in blue, uh, which was found by Holzendorf, uh, is present when, this, well, when uh, CTRA is not present. And CTRA, as I showed you, controls 95 genes. That directly controls 95 genes uh, by doing chip-chip analysis. Uh, and GCRA controls the expression of approximately 50 genes. And these 50 genes are involved in DNA replication and chromosome segregation. So the swarmer cell has it. Then it goes away by proteolysis. 
GCRA builds up. In the early pre-divisional cell, one is going away and the other is building up, so you have CTRA here. Then you have the differential expression of uh, GCRA because here it can't be made. Here you clear out CTRA and GCRA can be made. So now when the cell divides, the asymmetry is not just morphological. This can swim, this has a stalk, this has CTRA, this has GCRA. And these are major transcription factors that are controlling different genes. So if we look now at a circuitry, uh, a regulatory genetic pathway that CTRA, activated CTRA phosphate controls, and its phosphorylation is a complicated uh, phosphokinase pathway. This CTRA phosphate controls all of these modules as I showed you initially. Here is CTRA phosphate sitting at five sites on the origin of DNA replication and silencing it. Clearly, the degradatory pathway is critical. Now, we can put on top of this the uh, 50 cell cycle regulated genes that GCRA controls controlling multiple events, multiple genes that are involved in replication of the chromosome and in segregation, as well as the localization of kinases at the cell pole. So how does GCRA and CTRA deal with one another? So, <coughs> excuse me, it forms a regulatory cycle. When CTRA is present, it sits on the GCRA promoter and silences it. It also acts, and, and excuse me, and when you get rid of CTRA, then you can turn on GCRA. When GCRA is turned on and does its thing, it then turns on the P1 promoter of CTRA. You make some CTRA, it's activated, it shuts off GCRA, it shuts off its P1 promoter, and turns on the very active P2 promoter. So what we have here is an oscillating circuit that has GCRA and CTRA doing their things at different times in the cell cycle. What was particularly surprising was that this oscillation is linked to DNA replication. And I'm going to come back to this again, but in front of the P1 promoter is a DNA methylation site and the transcription of this gene is dependent on this being in the uh, hemimethylated state. Now, the GCRA gene, which we know is turned off by CTRA, what turns, it's on, what turns it on? And that turns out to be DNAA, a protein that has been known in bacterial, almost all bacterial cells seemingly forever. DNAA is a protein that's required for the initiation of bacterial DNA replication. It does so by interacting with the single origin of replication, allowing it to open up and form the replisome. Not too long ago, a couple of years ago, both in Alan Grossman's lab studying Bacillus subtilis and in our own lab, uh, Alison Hattes and Justine Collier, showed that DNAA is a transcription factor and it's a transcription factor for approximately 50 genes that are needed right at that time in the cell cycle. So just like CTRA does double duty as a repressor or silencer of the origin of replication and a transcription factor, then DNAA does double duty as an activator of DNA replication uh, and uh, as well as a transcription factor. So now that we knew that somehow this cycle is hooked up to the replication of the chromosome, you know, it was a puzzle. You know, how, how could this be? How could all these parts be integrated? How does the cell know when to do X or Y or Z? How are the modules ordered? Uh, so we then decided, and then is including Martin Thanbickler and Patrick Viollier and Patrick McGrath, we looked at the Colobacter cell, and, and it was pretty much assumed that the bacterial chromosome was a bowl of spaghetti sitting inside of the cell with no nuclear membrane. And it was, there were indications that the cell at least knew where the origin was and where the terminus was. And that's shown here. Uh, the origin sat at this pole of the cell where the flagellum was, and the terminus sat at the other pole. So what we wanted to ask is, where are the rest of the genes in the cell? 
all the other loci? Is it really just a random mess? And so uh, using a well-known technique at that point in which you put in a, a whole array of DNA binding proteins to a specific place on the chromosome, here we're putting in TET-O sequences. And uh, then we had a plasmid driving TET-R uh, fused to YFP. And if we turned on that plasmid, uh, we were able then to attach this tagged, fluorescently tagged binding protein to a site in the chromosome, and that would light up a specific place in the cell. We also, in all the experiments we did with this kind of technique, we did fish so that we didn't have to just depend on multiple uh, pieces of DNA stuck into the chromosome, and we confirmed it all with fish analysis. And so doing this, uh, what we found is that the chromosome is really amazingly ordered. What I'm showing you here is a cartoon. It does not mean that this is the order. All we do know is that where a genetic loci exists on the chromosome reflects where it sits in the cell. So that loci closer to the origin or sit down here. Further away, they move up the gradient so that there is a specific place. And it, it has a radius of attachment, but it's within an area for individual loci in the cell. So here we have the origin of replication. Uh, when you get rid of CTRA and you're no longer silencing the origin, then you build the replosome, and that's shown here in green on this region. Uh, then what you find is that as soon as you initiate DNA replication, the newly duplicated origin can be seen to harpoon across the cell and establish itself at the other pole. Uh, and here you have the light blue new chromosome going up and the old stuff getting smaller, and you keep moving it apart. And what I show down here is actually a movie of the uh, tagged origin of replication, which is shown here, being duplicated and harpooning across the cell. Uh, to us, this was very exciting. Uh, it is not as showy as looking at eukaryotic cells, but this rather blew my mind when it happened. We could actually see a locus move across the cell and calculate its speed of movement. Now, a graduate student in the lab, Esteban Torres, has recently shown that the thing that first moves across the cell is not the colobacter origin of replication, but a sequence not far away from it called the PARS sequence. And in a very elegant series of experiments, uh, Esteban showed that it is this PARS sequence that sits away from the origin of replication that moves first across the cell. And that PARS is the centromeric sequence that is the site of force generation that drives chromosome segregation. And by making a series of uh, inversions, he was able to show that no matter where you put this PARS sequence, that's what moved first. And you had to replicate through it in order to get the movement. So now what I show here is a overview of what I've been telling you. Here now is the swarmer cell. Uh, now I'm showing this little red dot or origin as par S. Terminus is here. You clear CTRA out of the cell. The rep replosome forms. What I've done here is indicated a genetic locus, some generic genetic lo locus in, in gold. And what happens here is you have par A driven segregation of par S. Uh, par A is an ATPase that assembles into a polymer. And uh, the newly replicated PAR-S sequence then moves across the entire cell. And when it reaches the other pole, it's anchored at that pole by a polymeric network of a protein called POPC. Uh, this was found in our lab by uh, Grant Bowman. Uh, at the same time as we published this in Cell, uh, we, uh, Christine Jacobs-Wagner also found POPC in her lab. So the work is definitely corroborated. Uh, two labs have it. Uh, and it's an amazing protein, because it's a 19 kilodalton protein that forms a very large polymeric complex at that pole and is essential for grabbing 
this centromeric sequence and holding it there at that pole. If you don't have POPC, the chromosome keeps trying to go to that pole, but it goes there and draws back, goes there and draws back. You have to grab it and keep it there. Uh, but now, coming back to the duplication of the chromosome, once the replosome moves through this locus, we find that it is segregated to the mirror image position of the incipient daughter cell. So that, in fact, we have segregation occurring while you're replicating the chromosome, and this region of the chromosome knows how to go to the right place. Uh, then you finish DNA replication, the replosome disassembles, and you get two cells that are, are mirror images of one another. This cell now cannot initiate replication. This cell, you get rid of CTRA so you can build the replosome and start again. So now that we know that there are very logical uh, progression of DNA replication occurring, how can we integrate multiple cell cycle events with this replication of the chromosome? So I'm going to tell you two short stories. One is the spatial regulation of division site placement, which is dependent on the positioning of that centromeric sequence. And the other is DNA methylation control of the actual cell cycle uh, regulators. So first, the division site placement. Uh, this, again, is the work of Martin Thanbickler. And Martin identified a protein called MIPZ, which is an, an ATPase, a PARA-like ATPase, that's absolutely essential for placing the uh, FITC gene in the middle of the, the FITC ring in the middle of the cell. Sure, we do know that when cell division happens, it, you have asymmetry in a smaller swarmer cell and a larger stock cell. But that's because once the division ring is laid down mid-cell, this portion of the cell does not grow as fast as that portion of the cell. Furthermore, we know that this shown in blue is the origin centromere region, and MIPC co-localizes with that origin region. So now here is, uh, which I should change this to uh, PAR-S at this point, or the centromere, and that is decorated by the PAR-B factor. And PAR-B then binds directly to MIPZ. And this was shown by surface plasmon resonance. But it doesn't, it doesn't just have a very orderly attachment. It seems to form some sort of gradient in the cell. So if we look at MIPZ EYFP, you see it at its higher con highest concentration at the pole, but then it becomes less and less as you move towards the center, whereas EGFP par B is very tightly bound at the pole. And this gradient of MIPZ concentration, which is highest at the uh, origin regions and lowest at mid-cell, is what, in fact, gives the function to the uh, MIP, uh, which gives the function to the MIPC par B complex. So how does it do this? Well, Martin showed that if you purify the FITZ protein, FITZ is a tubulin that has to assemble into these long polymers. If you add purified MIPZ to purified FIT, uh, uh, FITZ, you get these short, non-functional curlicues. And then he went on and showed that MIPZ, in fact, stimulates the GTPase activity of uh, FITZ, uh, preventing it from assembling. So therefore, we knew that we could put together a model of this cell in which here's the, uh, the centromere, or origin sequence, decorated with the PAR-B segregation factor. MIPZ is on it. At the other pole of the cell, and this is a new pole that just resulted from a cell division, so you have a pool of the FITZ uh, protein or tubulin sitting here. And as you now duplicate this region of the chromosome, you redecorate it immediately with PAR-B and MIPZ. And as it moves across the cell and sees, hits the FITZ, the FITZ moves to the region 
of lowest concentration of MIPZ, and that's where it assembles. And I can actually show you this. So what I'm showing you here are two cells. Uh, in red, I show uh, the par B bow to the origin region, and in green is the pool of Fitz Z at this pole. Here's just a second cell. We initiate DNA replication, and as it moves across the cell, it hits the Fitz Z, and Fitz Z assembles mid cell. And we can, Martin has elegant movies where he can chase the Fitz Z around the cell so that wherever MIBZ is, Fitz Z can't polymerize. So, in fact, what Martin has shown that this complex represents a novel system that coordinates chromosome origin segregation with the initiation of cell division. And furthermore, it ensures the proper localization of the division plane to mid cell, the region of lowest concentration of the MIBZ inhibitor. Now, turning to the second story uh, that is involved closely with the coincidence of DNA replication and segregation, the DNA methylation control of the cell cycle master regulators, we knew, and I've been showing you, that G this is a Western blot of uh, when each of these proteins is present in the cell going through the cell cycle. And we knew that GCRA is turned on here. GCRA turns on CTRA, CTRA turns on the DNA methyl transferase, and DNAA, which starts the whole thing, because DNAA turns on GCRA, et cetera, what turns on DNAA? And how do you, in fact, make this a cycle? So what Justine Collier found is that it depends on the methylation state of the promoter region. So let me see if I can make this clear. Here is a colobacter chromosome. Here is the origin of replication. I flipped it over. Here is the terminus. This is where the DNAA gene sits. This is where the CTRA gene sits. In bacteria and in colobacter, replication is bidirectional. And when you begin this, and now we're in the swarmer cell, cell is just divided, the chromosome is in the fully methylated state, a specific sequence. G-A-N-T-C is methylated on Watson and Crick. One way to put that. Uh, there is a DNA methylation site within the DNAA promoter. And uh, this is in a fully methylated state, so the DNAA gene is transcribed. Uh, however, CTRA is also in a fully methylated state, and it's not transcribed because this guy can only be transcribed from a hemimethylated promoter. Now, as the replication initiates and moves through first the DNAA gene, you get two copies of the gene that are now both in the hemimethylated state. Because remember, I told you, you don't turn on that DNA methylating enzyme till the end of the cell cycle. So this is now hemimethylated. Uh, you turn off the transcription of DNAA. The replication fork on this side hasn't yet it's CTRA, so this guy is not transcribed either. However, once the replication fork travels through the CTRA gene, creating two hemimethylated copies, then you turn on the transcription of that P1 promoter of CTRA. Therefore, the passage of the replication fork itself controls methylation state and thereby controlling the timing of activation of the promoters of these two genes. Now, I want to remind you that each uh, protein is controlled at multiple levels. It's controlled by turning on its transcription. It's controlled by proteolysis at the right time of the cell cycle. It's controlled by positioning. And it's controlled by activation. CTRA has to be activated. DNAA has to be activated. So there are multiple levels of control. We found that if we moved DNAA far away from its normal site, so the timing of its transcriptional control is changed, the cell is still alive, but it's severely impaired. If you make a mixed population of a wild-type cell and a cell in which this gene is moved down here, the, gene in, the cell in which this is moved is going to disappear within a, a generation. It's gone. 
Uh, and the same thing is true of moving the CTRA gene. And the, curiously, moving the CTRA gene, the cells seem confused. They're of all different sizes. And we don't really know what causes this, but they're not dead. So what we're looking at is robustness. If we put back into this circuit everything I've told you, this would be the epigenetic control. And that's not really the correct phrase. What this is is differential methylation of these genes. So DNA A, which is transcribed from a fully methylated promoter, controls. Here it was 40 genes. I think it's up to 50 now. DNA A then turns on GCRA, which controls about 50 genes. GCRA turns on the P1 promoter of CTRA. I told you about this oscillating circuit. CTRA controls about 95 genes and inhibits DNA replication. And it also turns on this DNA methyltransferase. Interestingly, there are two methylation sites uh, within the plus one region of CCRM. And as soon as these are methylated, you turn off the expression of CCRM. So this DNA methyltransferase is, is like a shot of the DNA methyltransferase. It methylates up 1,400 GANTC sites around the chromosome, and then is cleared out of the cell very rapidly by proteolysis. Then, while it's rapidly turning on a whole bunch of genes, it methylates up the DNA A gene, and you can start the cell cycle all over again. So in fact, given all of these uh, coordinated events that occur to give you a logical progression of the cell cycle, we can make some conclusions. One, we believe that there's a small number of regulated of master regulators that are controlled both temporally and spatially, and they oscillate throughout the cell cycle. The uh, control system is hierarchically organized. Uh, you know, there's stuff at the top that turns on these and turns on these. A beautiful example of that is the flagella hierarchy. Functions are turned on as modules just in time when needed. And the synchronization of this whole cell cycle engine uh, is linked to multiple other events. For example, I showed you that the, cell, the reliable cell cycle functions, the order, is linked to chromosome replication and is also linked to the phosphosignaling pathway, which is linked to the correct time of proteolysis during the cell cycle. So you can get rid of things when you have to get rid of them. And most importantly, the three-dimensional organization of the cell matters. The dynamic spatial positioning of these regulatory proteins is essential to their function. Uh, their position of the regulatory genes on the chromosome can be essential. And compartmentalization triggers cell differentiation. So we have a paradigm here where it's not enough to study the transcriptional regulatory network. That is just a layer of multiple layers of control. And if you want to model a regulatory pathway, simply looking at a transcriptional network can be very misleading. Overall regulatory wiring diagram, of course, is selected for robustness. And in fact, this DNA methylation regulation uh, is something that contributes to the fitness of the organism, not life and death. So in fact, what I've shown you is that there is a forward bias circuitry that drives cell cycle progression. And the progression through the cell cycle is paced in a ratchet-like fashion so that you have gates moving forward and opening allow you to go from one state to another. And what I've shown here is just some of these gates coming back to the first slide I showed you when I started this talk. So here is the cell cycle. Here are the functional modules. One of the gates is that replication initiation is triggered by proteolysis of CTRA. It's clearly not the only thing, but it's one of the licensing events. Then DNA origin segregation to the opposite pole triggers the cell division machine. Another gate, always moving forward. Gate three, the compartmentalization at this point in the cell cycle triggers daughter cell asymmetry by trapping different regulators at the two different poles of the cell. So in fact, what I've shown you is that if you take a 
a logical approach to the cell cycle, trying to understand how multiple events happen at specific times and are dependent on all the events that happen before it, you get the forward progression throughout the cell cycle and we have a systematic explanation of cell cycle expression in a living cell. And uh, what I have here is I'd like to thank the extraordinary group of graduate students and postdocs who have worked on this not only currently, including Antonio Iniesta and Grant Bowman and Esteban Torres, but the large group of people who now all run their own labs and are fierce and incredibly wonderful competitors uh, running their own Colobacter lab. And I also want to mention that our lab is closely integrated with the lab run by Harley McAdams. Harley McAdams is a physicist who has become interested and learned the language of genetics and biochemistry. And in his lab, uh, his students are all getting their PhDs in computer science, double E, or physics. Uh, and what we've done is we've integrated our two labs so that we have physicists sitting next to geneticists and electrical en engineers sitting next to biochemists. And instead of a biologist saying, look, we have this problem, Mr. Physicist, solve this for us, we design the experiments together. And we understand what we need to ask the questions and how we can interpret the results. Sure, these guys help us write algorithms, and they help us figure out how to build beautiful, technologically advanced equipment, but that's not the point. We learn each other's language, and we learn to think in different ways. So uh, I would like to sort of give a plug for interdisciplinary work. Uh, I work closely with Holly. Not everybody can work quite as closely as he and I do, since he's my husband. Uh, but we do know how to talk to each other, and after all these years, we still get along. And so uh, I really recommend integrated labs. I think they're wonderful. And with that, I'd like to thank you all very much. I'd like to thank Professor Shapiro for the amazing seminar. And it just shows you that the Colobacter has come a long way and uh, is now a household word. <laughs> so uh, Professor Shapiro is willing to entertain questions. And we'll do that up here. Yes, please come up to the microphone. Thank you. So the force that drives one ORI to the next after you get the uh, initiation, initiation presumably that y you asked me to think about it yesterday, mm -hmm. just here in your seminar, it seems to me that just the replication fork itself might be enough to move. Yeah, but it's the, not. The other, it's uh, not. How, how yeah, can you it, eliminate If you that? have uh, a mutation in PAR A that prevents it from uh, hydrolyzing ATP, everything stops. But, but that says that it's necessary, but it might not be sufficient. So part of the act, okay. that, that okay, activity is required. Okay, I give you that. Required. It could contribute, and, and Rich Lozick has, has suggested that the force of replication per se could contribute to it. But right. clearly it's but not. But there's not a filament that runs through Oh, yes, the cell. there is. There is that, that it might par track a, along. No, PAR-A polymerizes. I see. So uh, you're thinking and that we maybe we've it moves. Shown, we've shown polymerization of PAR-A both in vivo and in vitro. And Ethan Garner has done the in vitro work uh, of the Colobacter pare. And yes, it is a polymer. <laughs> OK. Uh, one, other, one other. There's a lot going on at the ORI at different times. Yeah. The, the vicinity. So presumably, the MITZ complex that spreads mm -hmm. uh, comes on after the initiation event? It doesn't? Yes, it, it comes so on. So the at... replication fork doesn't move through it? No, no, no. And it, it's it. decorated. No, it's a very complicated business going on at that. You know, I use the word centromere. What I'm doing is referring to a sequence that is the site of force generation. Clearly, we have to define all the proteins that are coming on and off that particular site as this event is occurring. Um, do you know something about um, how uh, widely distributed in evolutionary history this particular modular architecture is? Well, this is present in, uh, whenever you look at an alpha proteobacteria, this whole system is in there. And what's interesting is that, for example, the whole CTRA regulation is there. But the output varies with respect to the ecological niche of the particular alpha proteobacterium. So that in Brucella, which infects people, 
it turned on a different set of genes ultimately than are turned on in Colobacter. In some alpha proteobacteria, CTRA is essential, as in Colobacter, and others, it's not. But in all instances, it's controlling genes that allow it to live and survive in its environment. Mm -hmm. So it is a master regulatory gene mm -hmm. in, in all of them, yeah. but it's but not it does necessarily controlling the same set of downstream That's right. genes. All right, thanks. Do you mind if I put you on the, on the spot, Lucy, and just Oh, say, well, please. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. I'm just curious. I mean, since you do collaborate with the physicists, what, what biological insight did you have mm -hmm. as a consequence of a collaboration with the physicists okay, that so you I wouldn't be, have had? I, there, are, there are a number of ways of answering that. I think the best example uh, is that when we were first contemplating what the organization of that genome was like, and we knew that the origin was at one pole, and we knew that the terminus was at the other pole, and what happened in between. We knew that we could tag individual loci. But the question was, all right, what do we do? Like lock up 20 graduate students in a dark room for 10 years? Uh, that didn't seem very logical. And so uh, working with some of our engineers and physicists, uh, they designed not only the computer-driven uh, microscope, fluorescent scope, but they designed the algorithms that let the computer analyze 50,000 images of 114 different tagged loci. And yes, individual, individual genes and their position in the cell had been visualized in E. coli and in Bacillus subtilis, but a few. We went up, now we're up to, I don't know, about 150. So the whole question was, how general is this? And we were able to answer a very important question. Because immediately, when we first started talking about this, my druthers was, well, you initiate replication, you keep replicating, and then you start moving. Or maybe you move the origin, and the rest comes after it's all duplicated. And you know, and the physicists and engineers said, wait a minute, that makes no sense. What you want to do is you want to do it at the same time. And let's see if the cell does. You know, hypothesis-driven research, right, as opposed to non-hypothesis-driven research. And so that's one example. But there are many others. So you talked about this um, uh, gate-driven architecture. Mm -hmm. um, so certain events have to happen for other events to happen. Mm -hmm. But then you also talked about the, um, the process depending on time. And so I was interested if there's a if there's also a master timer, if you think. So, so both time and the mm -hmm. conditions for the gates to happen yeah. have to be true. Like, can you slow things down? You can slow things down by growing them on media that they're not very happy on, on a carbon source that takes a lot to use. So you can slow down the generation time, but you get exactly the same pathway. And another timer, of course, is the movement of the replication fork, right? because that's when you get things turned on, and that lets you continue at least at that level. But there are not only control mechanisms of transcription, there are all those other layered control mechanisms that contribute to the timing that are connected with the morphology of the cell and the time when you get compartmentalization. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's a layered and complicated gate opening as you move through to give you timing. So I wanted to ask you, it's very obvious that the localization of the termini and the origin at the two opposite mm -hmm. poles is, is very important for all this story. But you showed um, that the whole chromosome is, is very localized in, mm -hmm. in different. What do you think the role of that oh, okay. is? So, where, where does that yeah. become important? So, so there, let me, let me try to explain a bit about what might be happening here. Um, the question is, are there many loci on the genome that attach to the membrane the way the centromere does to the pole? Is there another one or two or none? And one possibility is once you harpoon the duplicated origin to the other pole, make believe that the replicating chromosome is like a rope and you're standing at the top of a swimming pool and you're coiling the newly replicated chromosome down into this swimming pool in the most logical energy saving conformation. And you're just wrapping it down and packing it down into the cell as though you're filling a phage head. And so it's not that it's grabbing onto sites and it's all specific, but rather it's just physics. 
just the most logical way of packing into the cell. This is a hypothesis. We don't know whether it's true. Uh, there might be sites, other sites, that are grabbing on to things uh, on, in the cell, but we don't know that. Uh, Esteban, is doing, who's sitting here now actually, is doing experiments to answer that. So hopefully the next time I come back, I can answer that question. I think you answered my question towards the end because you said the, something about the methyl transferase added to the robustness of the system, mm -hmm. but it wasn't required. So I assume by that a deletion of the methyl transferase is not lethal? It's lethal. How about overproduction? Uh, Overproduction is not lethal, but the cells are right. sick well, as so hell. That, I, I think that's far from just contributing to robustness. It's, it's yeah, essential but, for them. Yeah, uh, that's okay. true. Uh, it is lethal, but we don't know all the functions of that. Okay. So my question was, is part of the coupling to growth because that methyl transferase requires SAM or tetrahydrofolic acid? SAM. Is the, SAM. So is, it, is growth coupled in, in an intimate way? via methionine levels or methionine biosynthesis? We've, ne we've, ne we've never done that. That's an interesting experiment. We've not asked that. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, even the SAM is cell cycle controlled and comes up at the same time in the cell cycle as uh, CCRM. But that's a good experiment. We should do that. What would happen if you uh, blocked cell division with cephalexin and you got filaments, but DNA replication continues? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've done that. Yeah, uh, and you have very sick cells. Sick? Sick. They're long and they die. <laughs> They're long and they die. And what would happen, E. coli has uh, uh, rounds of replication in rich media that mm -hmm. initiate before We completion. can't do that in Colobacter because it's so tightly coordinated. I, right. But do you think this kind of mechanism would work in uh, an organism like E. coli? Well, E. coli has its own way of regulating the initiation of replication, right. Right. which has to do with the SEC protein. Right, that binds all the to other site, you know, all the other gates that you. Yeah, well, I think that E. coli is going to have different kinds of gates. I think right. whatever I've told you applies to the alpha proteobacteria, right. and not all bacteria. Right. And bacteria are very clever creatures, and they have designed all kinds of different regulatory mechanisms. Is it going to be a logical progression? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not stochastic events that make E. coli be E. coli. Uh, they just haven't been worked out in this way. And right. what's helped this, of course, is we can synchronize these cells easily, and there's very tight control. And this tight control is not observed in E. coli. Um, are there any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. For a wonderful lecture. We appreciate it.